Hey everybody, and welcome to Passive House Accelerator Live, where we explore how to create healthy buildings that both slash greenhouse gas emissions and make us more resilient to the impacts of climate change. We'll dive into how passive house design principles are applied in the real world, and how these buildings improve the lives of the people who live, work, and play in them. On the first and third Wednesday of the month, we'll feature the Project Showcase edition of Passive House Accelerator Live. And on the second and fourth Wednesdays, we'll feature the Construction Tech edition. Every Wednesday is for the Passive House newbie and the Passive House expert alike. If you are new to Passive House, check out the 101 section of our website for a primer. With that, please enjoy this Construction Tech edition of Passive House Accelerator Live, co-hosted by Kevin Brennan, Shannon Pendleton, Sean St. Amour, and Mark Willey. And as questions occur to you during the show, please type them into chat and we'll get to them during the discussion session. Thanks. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm Kevin Brennan from New York City. I'm a contractor training here in uh, New York City. And one of the things I teach about a lot is the passive house uh, tradesperson. And we always dive into that controversial topic of ventilation, what to ventilate with, how to ventilate, what's the machine, what's the requirement, and it's all new to everyone. Everyone's kind of used to minimum ventilation of bath fans and, and range hoods. But tonight we're going to dive into... Uh, passive house ventilation and Scott's going to share his experience in both designing and, and his project that he lives in and also the, the tricks and tools that he has. I can give you a little bit of insight. It's going to be awesome. We're going to talk nerdy things like IAQ monitors and other stuff like that, but fresh air is what we all need. And ventilation is one of the, like the really, really kind of key things to passive house. Cause I remember what really hooked me in the beginning when I first got involved in Passive House was that at Sydney Place, when they talked about that house, the daughter in the house who suffered from asthma didn't have asthma anymore. So a tighter sealed house with proper ventilation allowed that teenage girl who was an aspiring soccer player to become a college, you know, a possible athlete playing in sports that possibly wouldn't have happened. So fresh air makes a difference and Passive House makes that all achievable. So I'll kick it off to my next co-host. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I guess I get to do two intros for Mark and myself since uh, Mark is out doing the crazy stuff that we know Mark is doing. I'm Sean Sanamore with Clay Construction, uh, gone back to the building world in your Vancouver. And if you didn't know already, March, as kind of what Kevin alluded to, is about ventilation. In February, which the month has now been changed to start with a pH, was all about air tightness. And for all the shows in March, the key will be ventilation, and we're great to have Scott kick off the event. And so I'll give it over to Shannon, who will get things started. Welcome, everybody. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, Zach, for getting us started tonight. And thank you all for coming. We are really glad you're here. You're in for a treat. And uh, we've got Scott Farbman with us tonight, as you may have surmised. He is an innovation lead and building performance analyst with DBHMS, which if you don't know them, they're a minority owned business with offices in Chicago, Grand Rapids, Philadelphia, Ahmedabad, and Delhi. So they're dedicated to high performing, efficient and sustainable buildings. But tonight, Scott's gonna talk about healthy indoor environments and ventilation in particular. So please join me in welcoming him and I'll throw some links in the chat so you can connect with him online. Welcome, Scott. All right. Everyone needs to breathe and eat. That is true. Uh, thanks for having me back. I was on a, a number of months ago and it was a great experience and I'm very fortunate and excited to be back and talking to all you lovely folks out there. I think last I checked, we're at like 90 people, which is pretty wild for me anyway. So thank you for the platform and the audience. I, I really So a little about me, I'm an architect by training. Uh, a number of years ago, I pivoted more to the consulting engineering world. It just seemed like a better fit for me. I've always loved performance and data and numbers. 
Um, so I, I put up my design hat and I, I took on more of the consulting and, and advisory role where I found a, a better fit for myself. Um, <clears throat> so I'm also a certified passive house consultant. So uh, I know that there's a split camp out there, but because FIAS is local to me in Chicago, that's the direction I ultimately went with my passive house consultant certification and accreditation. Uh, and then, you know, lead stuff a number of years ago, just because everyone had to do it at some point uh, to, to check the box there. Um, recently promoted to innovation lead. So I, I really focus on what I see is up and coming in the industry and trying to keep my studio and my company nimble and uh, quick on their feet so that we could not only stay ahead of things, but adapt to new trends, new technologies, et cetera. And one of my primary goals and, and passions is to expand our uh, Passive House portfolio, the projects that we work on. Um, and I will get into that a little bit later. Uh, so Shannon mentioned uh, DBHMS is our company. We're traditionally an MEP engineering firm, but we have a studio that I'm part of. It's called Database Plus, and that's where we do our high performance consulting, energy modeling, uh, and sustainability certification. So uh, our primary office is in Chicago, but we, uh, our commissioning office is out of Grand Rapids in Michigan. We have a couple people down in Texas in San Antonio. Uh, and then we have a handful of people in Philadelphia and Boston. Um, yeah, projects like really start in the Midwest because we're, we're pretty new, founded in 2002, uh, but we've slowly expanded our reach. We're, we're got a good presence on the East Coast uh, on the commercial side, and we're starting to get some more projects on the West Coast too, which is uh, of course very exciting. Um, splattering of expertise here, um, licensed engineered professionals, lead APs, a uh, couple well APs. We have two uh, passive house consultants. We've got a HERS Raider, and we've got an NFRC certified simulator, which is a weird one, but he's, you know, Windows are his jam, uh, pun intended there, I guess. Uh, he really, you know, he loves Windows and, and simulating Windows, and he's found that when it comes to submittal time from the manufacturer, they're, they're cutting a lot of corners and claiming certain performances that aren't really true in reality, and I'm sure for those of you who have installed Windows, you've encountered similar situations. Um, <clears throat> one certified uh, Passive House project in the books. We've got five underway right now, ranging from design to under construction. Uh, and then, you know, some other stuff, you know, a bunch of lead projects and, and the likes. So I think what makes our company really interesting and something that I really enjoy is just the, the, the plethora of experience and specializations. Uh, on the left-hand side here, we've got uh, DBHMS, which is our traditional studio, our MEP engineers, and our commissioning folks, which really came out of LEED, so they have a focus on fundamental system commissioning, but they've recently expanded to uh, really high expertise in building enclosures, uh, so it dovetails, you know, with the, the Raider Verifier aspect of, of Passive House. Um, they do a lot of HERS work and a lot of Energy Star work. So uh, a lot of projects go after enterprise, enterprise green communities. They're involved in those. Uh, and then here on the right-hand side, Database Plus, which is the studio I'm part of. Um, this is what I think is the fun part of our company because we get to do all the neat uh, simulation work, uh, whole building energy analyses, net zero energy simulations, feasibilities. Um, Another thing that I'm spearheading right now is a carbon footprint and carbon modeling assessment uh, with all of the heat from uh, IPCC reporting and, and climate change, uh, really taking a, a hard look at embodied carbon and what we're putting into our buildings up front is of, of most importance right now. So I'm working really hard to expand our abilities to, to model for carbon. I know PHPP has a plugin for that. There's a lot of really cool stuff out there and it's really, really exciting. Um, and then uh, we have a sustainability planning arm that, that um, runs a lot of the certification consulting aspects. So traditionally uh, lead accredited services and um, got a couple well projects now, which is really exciting. And then of course the past boss work too. So got all that stuff out of the way, can start talking about what everyone's here for hopefully uh, in the agenda today is just a 
you know, because there's some 101 aspect to this and some 300 level aspect, do some general introduction on ventilation, what it is, why we look at it, what our options are. Um, I'm, because I have the opportunity, I'm going to talk a little bit about my at home indoor air quality experiments, so to say. I'm going to touch uh, a little bit on the design work that we've done to date with passive house ventilation. And then hopefully, yeah, some good time for Q&A. Please like ask any question you want. I'm by no means a ventilation expert, so I'll do the best I can to answer stuff honestly. I'm sure there's some folks out there who can jump in if I fall short. And uh, really, I love to talk about this stuff. So uh, looking for a lively conversation here at the end. So why do we need to be ventilating? This is hopefully pretty obvious to everyone. There's the, you know, the, the stat that gets thrown around 90% of our time is indoors. So uh, most of the things we're exposed to are coming from our indoor environments. Uh, I think this is an interesting thing to look at even more so now. I don't know about all you out there, but we've predominantly switched to work from home since uh, early, early-ish 2020. So I've been working out of my living space for the last two years, and it has really given me uh, a unique perspective on what it is to, to really be in a home full time. Um, having that fresh air available, love it, really need it. Uh, being able to control indoor pollutants, that's where I'll touch on my experience with what I'm seeing inside my house, which full disclosure is not a passive house, probably very far from what a passive house is and should be, but you know, we don't all get the opportunity just yet. And I'm you know, pretty young, need to make a little bit more money before I can maybe get that passive house uh, built for myself and my family. Um, comfort, always an issue uh, with, with ventilation and space heating cooling. Uh, and then, like Kevin mentioned, reducing health risks, especially respiratory illnesses. That that really is coming coming to full full picture for me up front. I think that's a cr really critical issue. Uh, and then, of course, on the building durability side, the more airflow you have moving through your house, uh, the better you can mitigate against condensation risk and you know that material durability issues that everyone hates to to deal with. Uh, all this stuff kind of doves dovetails together: material durability and mold health, like everything really, really connected here. So a lot of things to, to pay attention to. So what are our concerns and, and really why do we need to be ventilating? I just gave a couple of these slides to a developer that wanted to do gas cooking and no exhaust, which is allowed in Chicago. And I'll get into that later. Hate it to death, but that's just the re reality we live in. Um, so combustion cooking has a lot of uh, risks and harms that come with it. And I know that at least me, and I can probably assume for a lot of you out there, we've been kind of preconditioned to think and know that cooking with gas is the best. You gotta, you gotta have a gas range, a 48 inch wide gas range to be that at home chef. And um, you maybe paid attention to it a little bit, but people are starting to speak out against that. I think the trend is catching on, but when you're cooking with gas, you're putting a lot of bad stuff into your indoor environment. You're putting um, small particulates, 2.5 mainly, which is the really small particulates that get deep down into your respiratory system, no good. Um, nitrogen oxide and dioxide, carbon monoxide, of course, which is probably the most common thing associated with burning gas uh, in your home. But if you ask, I would say 50-50 chance if you ask someone out there about carbon dioxide in your house, they'll be like, I have a carbon monoxide detector, I'm good. Um, so I just think that that, you know, some of these things might be commonplace to us, but general public level don't, can't, can't differentiate between a lot of these pollutants. And um, maybe that's not a bad thing, but knowing that there's bad stuff happening, that's, that's what's most important. And then a new one to me, um, there could be some formaldehyde issues with burning gas. Uh, I didn't know that. That's come off some recent research. Um, so because we're putting potentially putting all this bad stuff into our air, that's why we, from an engineering like ethical point of view, really push for proper ventilation and exhaust at any opportunity we have. Passive house or no passive house, our first recommendation is you have to ventilate and exhaust right, or you're going, you know, you're 
potentially liable for some health impacts. That are new research and some recent research, so Rocky Mountain Institute put out a really huge research um, paper on the impact of gas stoves, uh, specifically looking at elevated nitrogen dioxide, so a pollutant we don't normally talk about, right, in our house, uh, and they're almost always exceeding the indoor guidelines and even outdoor standards for what you want in your space. Um, and then this is a big one. They hard identified that there's a direct correlation to illnesses uh, and an increased risk with children, which no one wants, right? Um, asthma, lung infection, and uh, also learning deficits, interestingly enough. Uh, the newest set of research is from Stanford. It came out earlier this year, I wanna say maybe January, and they found that methane was the major emitter from gas stoves in an off position. So your stove doesn't even need to be on and it's leaking meth methane, uh, not guaranteed, but they found a lot of instances of methane being leaked into your house with your gas stove off, which is wild to me. Um, and then, the, you know, Qualifier here, they said, hood use and ventilation are effective in reducing concentrations and nitrogen oxide and other pollutants. So they're saying like, okay, if you're going to use gas, you have to exhaust and ventilate right, or you're uh, exposing yourself to possible risk and harm. So this is a, a fun slide. So gas cooking in the headlines, uh, if you follow the news and some of our favorite you know, publication sources, you've probably seen a lot of these. So the Atlantic, kill your gas stove. NPR, we need to talk about your gas stove. The Guardian, gas stove making indoor air five times dirtier than outdoor. Vox, gas stoves can generate unsafe levels of indoor air pollution. And the New York Times, your stove just needs to vent. Um, this to me is huge because we like to talk about this stuff in our small circle, people who are all on the same page, we could talk it to death maybe we get a couple people to adopt it because we're so passionate about it. But once it hits the mainstream and the media, people are gonna start asking about this sort of thing. I'm sure people, I'm sure you all may have clients out there asking about induction cooking and, and that's great. And that's really what I wanna see. It needs to be driven from the, the end consumer if you really wanna make substantial change here and get um, gas out of our, our new homes and, and figure out a way to phase it out of our existing homes too. So what are our options then if we wanna ventilate? And Kevin touched on a couple of these. Um, your older existing homes out there, probably just relying on infiltration and operable windows to bring in fr fresh air. And obviously all the research is saying that's not adequate and you're gonna have problems. Um, I wish I could do a poll because I would love to know how many people on the call uh, in their home right now don't have any sort of ventilation or exhaust system, mechanical. Uh, the second option is mechanical exhaust only. So fans in your bathroom, maybe a whole house fan, uh, just sucking stuff out, that's it. And then the makeup air is either provided through an operable window, but we all know behavior there. You usually don't have a window open when you need it. You probably have it open when you don't need it. Um, so that makeup air is coming through infiltration. And uh, that's not a good approach, especially as construction techniques get better and energy codes progress. Enclosure tightness is being uh, required. I mean, the threshold there for spectrum is pretty wide, but some level of enclosure, and uh, enclosure tightness is being required through energy code. And the tighter homes get, the less you can rely on infiltration to be that means of makeup air. And you're pulling air through all those like weird nooks and crannies of your wall that God knows what's in there too. So uh, not, not my favorite approach. Um, third option being mechanical supply only. So uh, I see this every once in a while, you just have a direct supply of fresh air being um, routed to your furnace uh, or your return line into your furnace. So anytime your furnace goes on, fresh air can be added to the return and then distributed through your home. Uh, that could work. Uh, I think you, you know, a lot of the folks out there know that if you're just pulling raw air from outside, you're, you're losing some energy there because you have to reheat it up. Uh, so not the greatest approach. And then the, the one that we all know and love is balanced mechanical ventilation. That's, you know, the passive house method. 
uh, bring in fresh air continuously, exhaust that same amount of air out, and then recover as much of that heat as you can to keep energy use low and indoor air quality high. Um, I want to say anecdotal, well, not anecdotally, I'm sorry. There's a study from Elevate Energy and the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. It's called the Breathe Easy Study, and I'll find a link and I'll throw it in the chat later. But they retrofitted uh, a number of homes in the Chicago area, most, mostly on the south and west side. Um, and they did a study where they did, uh, they tried exhaust only, supply only, and then balanced ventilation. And in terms of improved indoor air quality and reduced health risks, of course, balanced ventilation was the winner, but exhaust only smashed supply only. So supply is the worst of the three. Uh, well, no ventilation is the worst of all, but of the three, supply only doesn't get rid of the bad stuff in your house. It only brings in new air and dilutes. Um, so just an interesting tidbit, and I'll, I'll throw that in the, the chat later. Uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Because I think I'm a little front heavy right now. OK, cool. Go quickly through some of this stuff. So industry standards, I thought it's good to throw this in here. So if you're not designing a passive house, this is likely what you're going to have to design to, at least in the US. Um, if you're in a commercial or a high rise building, you probably are looking at ASHRAE 62.1. And that uh, is 50 CFM continuous. Uh, or 100 CFM intermittent. So a lot of airflow there. Uh, ASHRAE 62.2, which is the residential and the low rise guide uh, standard, um, five air changes per hour in your kitchen, uh, or 100 CFM intermittent in your kitchen. And then uh, international code or the international residential code, this is what aligns most closely to the passive house requirements. Uh, 25 continuous, which is you know low and nice, um, or 100, 100 CFM intermittent. So just wanted the, to frame it a little bit so everyone knows kind of what guidelines or codes you might be uh, designing to if you're not looking at pass house. So my at-home experience uh, and experiment. Um, I have an aware element, which is uh, shown here on the left-hand side. I also have a Kytera SenseEdge Mini which is more of a, a commercial application that I've gotten gifted to me to test out. Um, I like them both for different ways uh, and different reasons, but the, the user interface, this, this really is meant for the typical user at home. So this is what I like to, to point out to everyone. Uh, it's got a really nicely designed UI on your app. Uh, it's got your total air quality, and then it's got your individual parameters that you're tracking. <clears throat> and it's got dedicated dedicated sensors to pick this stuff up. So, uh, so dry bulb temperature, relative humidity, uh, carbon dioxide in parts per million, uh, total VOCs, which is a good metric, but a tough metric, and I'll explain why in a minute. And then small particulate, 2.5 here. Uh, <clears throat> so when you're looking at this thing, you see a bunch of dots, and then you need to make the correlation to what the dots represent. So with CO2, and I think this is maybe commonly known, uh, you're, you're basically shooting for less than 1,000. Uh, and if you can be in the under 600 range, that's considered to be good, and you're not going to have any uh, adverse effects. Uh, outdoor levels range from like four to 500, depending on where you are and what's going on in your region. Um, once you start to get in this elevated and, and well beyond the 1,000 1, mark, that's where the research says you're going to start to feel some of the effects, um, less productivity, feel stuffy, things like that, adverse effects to comfort, uh, all that stuff. With TVOCs, uh, we're looking at parts per billion here. Um, these are the ranges we want to be in. So again, try to keep it under 1,000. Once you get above that threshold, you might start feeling like irritated stuff on your skin, have some breathing issues. You're breathing in kind of chemical off gassing, so you can kind of you can guess what. And then small particulate PM 2.5 really want to be under 15 here, uh, and this is the one where if it does get the content um, gets above a certain level, you could end up with resp respiratory issues. <laughs> this is fun. So this is a snapshot of the Sense Edge Mini. So different from the platform I was just showing you. 
Uh, this sensor is in our bedroom. It's the place we spend the second most amount of our time sleeping. Um, <clears throat> we have the, the, the aware element is in our kitchen living room area, you know, the, the main place where we spend our time cooking and hanging out. But this is a, a TVOC reading across the last month. And I've noticed that we've had really elevated levels of VOCs in our bedroom. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why. And every night you can see a, there's a dip and a dip and there's a dip because we've been opening windows in our balcony door to get as much fresh air in before we go to bed. And then right after that, it just shoots right back up. And I don't know what's going on. Um, and this is a frustrating thing. And I think it's it kind of falls into the like ignorance is bliss category a little bit. If you weren't tracking this, I would have never known this was a problem and I'd be living happily and not be stressed out over this. But because I know it's an issue, I'm trying to desperately figure out what's going on. And one of the complications with TVOC is it's a conglomerate of volatile organic compounds, uh, a lot of them. I don't know how many, but there's a lot. So you don't know what specifically is the thing that's triggering which specific VOC is triggering the sensor to go bonkers until you do uh, like a really high end indoor air quality sampling and send it to the lab. So that's kind of where we're at, like this crazy spike, you know, I don't know what we're doing. Um, we don't tend to, you know, don't have crazy cosmetic products or anything like that going off. We don't have a lot of home cleaner. Um, really, this is a stump stumping me, but what this is telling me is in our home, we don't have continuous fresh air being supplied to our bedroom. And that would really help us out here big time. This is just for reference. So this is the same thing, TVOC, but a different time scale. This is the past seven days. And this is where you could see, really see the dips when we open the doors at night before bed, it comes down, but then just, it goes right back up right away. So something weird's going on and we're gonna figure it out eventually. Here's, uh, so this is the aware elements. You can get it off Amazon. I love the device, or I think we might have a sponsor link or something at some point. This is in our kitchen. So this is what I've been using to track the impact of cooking uh, in our home when, when cause I love to cook uh, and I love to make a bunch of stuff and I wanna know what's happening when I cook. So on the left-hand side here, um, this is PM 2.5. And I was searing vegetables for dinner and it spiked to about a hundred, which is a very high level. And um, I have a, in a, a direct exhaust range hood, but it's one of those integrated microwave ones. So, you know, it aligns with the upper cabinets and then, you know, the cooking surface still extends out, you know, a good like foot, 18 inches from there. And what I've found is that approach doesn't do a good job collecting the contaminants that burn off the front burners. And that has been a critical issue for me. And I desperately want to change out that to a proper range if I can. That's my Band-Aid fix. My long-term fix is to switch to induction. Um, this is carbon dioxide. So still the same day, still the same cooking. And uh, when you get two humans down there, you've got a couple dogs and you've got open combustion kind of burning some of that free oxygen in your space, you start to see the parts per million of, of carbon dioxide take a bigger uh, chunk out of what's there. So 740, 750, not critical, but it's starting to elevate and get to the point where I'm concerned. And again, this is like a window open and exhaust going, and we're still up in this range, which is a little alarming to me. And then finally, same day, but in the morning, uh, looking at chemicals, so TVOC, uh, my spouse got me this, I love coffee. She bought me this really nifty siphon uh, coffee maker where, uh, I don't know if you saw Breaking Bad, but it's similar to how they use chemistry to make coffee. Um, it's vacuum activated and there's an open flame and gosh, um, I'm not the greatest advocate because I do like to have some of these nifty things at home sometimes. So I'm a little bit of a hypocrite here. I'll be the first to accept that. I like some of this stuff still, um, but open flame, I'm burning like an alcohol based fuel and the TVOC just boom off the charts like immediately. And again, exhaust on windows open, doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> this is fun stuff. I hope everyone's having as much fun as I am because I love talking about this. Uh, so, 
kind of the, the final wraps of my at home experience and experiment. Um, so what, from what I've learned and seen, what I'm trying to do is uh, it doesn't matter what I'm cooking or what I'm doing in the kitchen. If the flame's on, gotta have the exhaust put on 100%. And uh, you need to have openings nearby to allow that fresh air to come in and kind of flush the space and drive that airflow. Um, we've also, because of the elevated, TO, uh, elevated VOCs that we found, we're doing kind of semi occasionally whole house flushes where we open all the windows, turn on all the fans and just try and get as much fresh air through the home as possible. Then really you like the, the pipe dream here is how could I get an ERV into our house so that we're continuously ventilating at least our critical spaces where we're spending the most time, our kitchen living and our bedroom. Uh, this is a good one for me. And um, I know this is a conflict in the passive house world, but I'm learning that sometimes energy needs to take a backseat to indoor air quality. There might be people who disagree, but um, you know we're talking about two big risks here, a long-term risk from energy use and climate change uh, and a short-term risk to our immediate health. And I think sometimes we need to put our health uh, forward and there's good ways to do that, like with an ERV, so you're doing both. Um, but I'm finding, you know, it's the dead of winter I, I'm still going to open a window to try and ventilate things when I need to. Okay, second half of the presentation. So DBHMS and, and Database Plus, uh, our Passive House experience, um, runs the gambit a little bit right now. So uh, my, my first and our first project was a single family home retrofit in Chicago. A uh, very cool project. I think it's the one I presented on the last time I was here. It's hard to keep it all, keep track of it all. Um, We've got a, a three-story, 50-ish unit uh, multifamily project in Gary, Indiana, which is a little surprising. Gary, Indiana represent Passive House. Um, we've got a source zero, so a net zero energy uh, Passive House project just got, through uh, just got through planning approval in Oak Park, Illinois. So that's just to the west of the city of Chicago. Um, and then the, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened here. The tag didn't come through, but this is another uh, low rise passive house multifamily project in the west side of Chicago that I think is in the, the 60 ish unit range. Um, we got a couple other in like feasibility study now. So we're looking at one high rise in Chicago. Uh, it was the recent winner of the C40 competition, if anyone's familiar with that, is in the loop. Uh, so they're looking at how could we make this high rise uh, passive house compliant. Um, and then I just it just kicked off a new project that I'm doing passive house consulting on that's going to be an 80, 80 unit, five story multifamily in the west side of Chicago, mostly affordable housing, which is great. And this is affordable, 100% affordable. This one is 20% affordable. And this one is 100% affordable housing. So love to see this stuff. Uh, so scaling up ventilation. So what, what, what have we typically seen? Um, I think the common practice, uh, at least because I, I'm just guessing that most of us out there are, are used to seeing this on a single family home platform, and that's an individual ventilation system. So you have one unit that is providing ventilation and exhaust to the entire house or the ent uh, entire dwelling unit. Then what are, what are our options for multifamily and how do you scale that up from what we're used to on a small house to you know a very large building. So we have three options. We have the individual, so it follows suit with the single family home approach. You have one unit per dwelling unit that provides ventilation and exhaust. Uh, we have the semi-central approach, which is, you know, it, it's loose here, but it's basically one unit serving a number of dwelling units. So the final option here is central, one unit for the whole building. Uh, could be split into two, maybe one serving one side, one serving the other side, but it's generally a centralized approach. Um, so what does this look like diagr diagrammatically? Um, this is our individual approach on a multifamily level. So you have an ERV per dwelling unit that is supplying to each and it's exhausting from all the main areas, uh, kitchen exhaust, toilet exhaust, all coming back to the RV, supply coming out, a um, little bit of a mishap here, like just 
Imagine this green line also coming through on all these rooms. Um, so this is how individual would look. Now uh, let's go one further. This is semi-central. So you would have a block of units that are served by one uh, ventilator, piece of ventilation equipment here, preferably an HRE or V. And this is doing the same thing individual does, but it's serving multiple rooms. So you've got exhaust from different dwelling units coming back to one unit, and you have supply going out to multiple uh, apartments. And here's our central approach. Uh, diagrammatically, this is how we've shown it, but this isn't how we typically do it. So one unit probably on the roof, and it just comes down, it, it branches down and it serves all of the units, both supply and exhaust coming back up. Each unit, each floor, everything from one unit. Now I'll throw the caveat in here. What we found to work better, and this is, I'll probably touch on this later, but I'll say it now is from the centralized unit, we uh, distribute horizontally on the top level. So we ask our nice architect friends to give us a little bit more floor height on the top level. So we'll spread out our ducts there and then we'll come down vertically in chases. So, you know, you're doing most of your horizontal at the top and then you're simply coming straight down vertically at different points on the floor plate. And we found that this approach is the easiest way to distribute save on duct work and uh, limit your static pressure and, and fan power um, <clears throat> if you're going centralized. So let's talk about pros and cons of each quickly. Um, and these are the pros and cons that I've seen. There's probably more out there. And if anyone else has some to add, let's, let's get it in there later during the discussion. So individual systems, minimal duct work. You're only supplying and exhausting very close to the unit. Don't need to run through corridors, anything like that, or common corridors. Uh, limited balancing issues, because you're only supplying to those rooms directly at the system level. Um, <clears throat> probably, you know, a bedroom, common area, pretty limited. Uh, another big pro that we're finding is higher recovery efficiency rates are easily or more easily attainable at the smaller system level, so like the Zender unit has a really high efficiency rate, uh, easier to get that than the centralized um, efficiency rate. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the cons that we're hearing, at least from the developers who own and operate their building, uh, and I know Tim McDonald has said this too, um, the individual unit by unit results in a lot of filters to be changed by maintenance staff. You have to go and change as many dwelling unit apartments there are that many filters. Um, so there's a lot more at the equipment level to maintain because there's many more units and it's spread out across the building. Uh, this is another one that is um, a pain point for some of the passive house people out there, uh, two penetrations per dwelling unit. So you need to exhaust and bring in fresh air at each unit. So every apartment is gonna have two penetrations to handle fresh air and exhaust in and out of the building. Um, <clears throat> a lot of architects don't like that aesthetically because you have a lot of grills and stuff in your facade. I know that there's some creative ways to do this. Uh, I've seen some people present it in a soffit on a balcony, um, but at the end of the day, you have a lot of holes in your building that you need to make sure are sealed. Properly. Let's go to semi-central. So less penetrations because you've just reduced the number of units. Um, <clears throat> less physical space required for equipment because you don't have every unit in each unit. Uh, you've got a semi-central, maybe let's just say one per floor. Maybe you could stash it in a ceiling somewhere. Maybe you have a closet dedicated for it. Just less physical area required. Uh, and then it allows for some diversity. So uh, we'll get into diversity a little bit later, but if you have boost, mo you know, boost modes on your fans in your bathroom to help mitigate, or I'm sorry, help help manage some of the humidity that comes from the shower. So you might be cranking up from 20 CFM to 60 CFM. Uh, when you have multiple apartments on that unit, you could take some diversity there and say, well, only 30% of the people are going to be boosting at once. So it gives you some flexibility on system sizing, um, but you're also taking a little bit of risk there. <clears throat> because you could run into capacity issues. Cons, uh, running more ductwork than individual, you're probably running a lot of horizontal ductwork in, in the corridor. 
corridors are already tight with fire protection and other things. Uh, it's just more to manage. Um, and then you may need multiple units depending on airflow. So hopefully you have one per floor, but you might need two. Uh, you never know until you get in there and design. Central systems, uh, least amount of penetrations. Uh, we found it so far to be typically the most economical, and that might surprise some folks out there. Um, it's the least amount of hours of maintenance because you're only changing one filter and you're only maintaining one unit. And um, <clears throat> it allows for the most diversity. So you're taking diversity across every unit in the, the building. Cons, uh, it is more difficult to balance, especially if you're doing diversity. So of course, trade-offs to everything. Uh, and then it, we found it's been harder to verify in the field because at least FIAS, uh, Passive House US, requires testing at a, a unit level, but then you also have this thing operating at a system level. So it's been difficult to, to juggle those two things. So what have we been designing um, on our multifamily buildings? We have been going predominantly towards the centralized system. And we found that we, at least in our Chicago buildings, we haven't been able to get the airflows low enough to design and size an affordable individual system. We really want to do an individual unit by unit um, because I think it gives you the best performance, but we just haven't been able to get it. Uh, and then another benefit to the centralized system is we can fine tune the total system size due to the diversity. So we don't need um, <clears throat> a huge unit because we could take some uh, savings on the diversity, assuming that only half the people are going to be uh, boosting at once or whatever the metric is there. Uh, what are some lessons learned from our centralized approaches so far? Uh, we've found that translating passive house principles from single family home to multifamily commercial is incredibly difficult and you know wildly, uh, wildly challenging. Um, we have also found that the systems that we would typically use, even on a high performance building, uh, don't really lend themselves well to the passive house requirements. And I think uh, uh, recovery efficiency rates is a key indicator there. And also your fan power to um, passive house has a really fine requirement, not a requirement, but um, due to the space heating load requirements, you have to be really careful with some of these things. And uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll get there in a second. So uh, <clears throat> heating and uh, heat and energy recovery ventilator efficiencies can manifest into a hard limit uh, to keep the project in certification range. So we found that 80% efficiency at our dedicated outdoor air system will not get us to the heating load requirement through Passive House. And uh, we need to up it to 85%. And what I'm trying to say is typical off the shelf unit could tank your certification. So you need to be very mindful of the heat recovery, both sensible and latent on the, the outdoor air equipment and make sure that you're working in a integrated and collaborative effort with the, whoever's doing your Wolfie model or your PHPP model. As I noted before, centralized systems are a little difficult to balance. Uh, and if you are doing ducting in your corridors, uh, you need to coordinate that ceiling space as, as early as possible. Last slide here, I'm gonna leave you with some nu nuisances or nuances of Chicago, which I um, like to talk about a lot. I'm very passionate about this and I, I do my best to advocate for improving code and policy, uh, not only in Chicago, but you know wherever I can be part of. So. The Chicago me Mechanical Code is severely outdated, like 20 years at least behind the time. So what the code requires is 1.5 CFM of exhaust in your bathroom and kitchens or an operable window. So what that means is in a bathroom, especially in a multifamily design, which doesn't typically get a window, we have to design for about 75 CFM of exhaust airflow in that bathroom. And we know IMC, ASHRAE, and Passivo says we want something like 20 continuous. City of Chicago doesn't recognize 20 continuous. They say it doesn't matter. We need it to be 1.5 or you put a window in there. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, 
Same goes for the kitchen. Kitchen is a little bit more of an easy hurdle because you can have a window somewhere in the general vicinity of kitchen on a multifamily project. So we've actually found that to be better for us because we don't need to meet any other wacky requirements. We just use the window for code compliance and then we do whatever mechanical ventilation exhaust. Another really terrible wacky thing, uh, toilet exhaust has to be independent from all other exhaust flows. So we can't commingle toilet and exhaust back to our energy recovery unit to recover all that heat. We have to only do toilet or only do kitchen. Um, we can't combine, there's no way around it. Maybe we go for variants. So hopefully that uh, shed some light on Chicago being um, a thorn in my side when it comes to best fast design. And with that, I end the presentation. I probably went too long. I got really excited about the front end, really wanted to talk about indoor air quality. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Excited for questions and discussion. Scott, you, Scott. bravo. You did a great job. And you nerded out there, Scott, because uh, for some of us that have been in this for a while, we understand indoor air quality is so important. Uh, for those that are new, uh, probably didn't know some of the things you spoke about and the facts you brought in. I know for myself, I was in Oakland for the Passos Network and uh, met a lot of people from the University of Berkeley were talking about indoor air quality and it blew my mind. And my aware is at 87. Uh, it's gone down because my office door is closed and the CO2 is rising. So if I start yawning, it doesn't mean I need a coffee. I just need to open the door or the window. So I appreciate the information you had. Um, it's so relevant today. And for those that, again, might be new to Passive House and trying to understand, you know, why this isn't so important is because when we work on making our buildings more airtight and we're making our buildings dry, ideally in both directions, that the building's only way they can breathe is through the fresh air machine, which Scott clearly identified many different options. And we are going to dive into some details. So we got about 10 minutes left. Five minutes, we'll talk about questions but great insight. And I have to say, one of the reasons why I love this event is the chat. There is great info posts in the chat, great links, great examples of how to do things to kind of emphasize on what Scott's doing. But when people like Melvin and Sarah, and I have to point you out because two leaders that I fully respect from Vancouver, New York, chatting about their experiences, it's pretty exciting when we have all of this energy and resources and you all have decided to come and collaborate and share your experiences. It really warms our heart. So thank you for uh, playing in the chat. Thanks, Scott, for all your knowledge. And uh, Shannon, I know we got some great questions. So we got a few minutes before we dive over to Zach. So let's fire up the questions. Sounds like a great idea. Thank you, Scott. I really loved the uh, information you shared about your own home. It made me feel better about my home. And it brought a lot of comments into the chat from other people talking about how their leaky homes are really how they're balancing their uh, cooktop vents. <laughs> yeah, I just, I want to say, you know, there's a lot of, I think, uh, old school people who think, you know, your house needs to be leaky and you're going to get all the fresh air you need. But I mean, we're proving that's wrong with at-home data every day. My house is leaky, very, very leaky. Doesn't matter. I'm not getting fresh air, or at least I'm not getting the fresh air you need to be healthy. That's a great point. Uh, I have clients say that to me all the time. Um, so thank you for proving <laughs> that out to be false. Our first question is from Gokul. Gokul, would you like to come on and ask your question? And if you are not available, I can ask it for you. He asked, or he thought it was very cool that you had a presence in India with the firm. And he wondered if you worked on any projects there. That is a good question. Uh, most of the actual project work was a bit before my time joining the company. Uh, so I don't have any good point of view on that. I know that we're still doing a bunch of commissioning work out there. Our commissioning folks fly out to India pretty frequently. Um, so I'd have, to, I'd have to follow up with some examples. Uh, but you might find something on the website. Very cool. All right. Well, we'll dive right into the spike theories. So when you were showing the spikes in your house, uh, people were throwing <laughs> theories in the chat. And uh, Zoe, Please. would you like to come on and share your theory? I think I wasn't, I wasn't alone in suggesting the mattress or, you know, bedding, pillows, things like that. But I liked, I forget whose theory was um, 
like their personal hygiene products. I'm gonna, okay, it's, it's the evening and hopefully people are drinking a little bit, but flatulence, farts, also trigger VOCs. I don't know if you people know that, uh, but I speculate that could be a, a contributor. Uh, if, mattress is a good call. We have a purple mattress, but we've had it for many, many years. This uh, issue we're experiencing seems to be new, um, at least since you know a couple months old. And, and really there's been no new pieces brought into the bedroom. I, I like, maybe it's, I suspect it might be stuff happening downstairs that just naturally gets pulled up upstairs and it just pools in our bedroom, which is right off the open stairway. Um, and it's just a consequence of like all the crap in the house. It would be interesting getting... to put it, put the sensor in different parts of the house to test that too. Yeah, I'm, I'm on it. Um, <clears throat> my, my spouse is a PhD and a scientist, so I have to run all scientific experiments past her first. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I can't just willy-nilly move things around. I need a sign off from, from the scientist at home. But I, I would love to have like 50 more of these things all throughout the house so I can track air quality in every possible room all the time. But that's just not realistic. I like that backup uh, with your wife. And uh, I, I want to infect my husband to have that same uh, rigor. So we're going to move over to Zach, and then we're going to come back with some more spike theories. So everybody hang out. Yeah, thanks, Sean, and thanks, Scott. This is awesome. I want to give a big thank you to those great organizations who make all of this possible, the Passive House Accelerator. So thank you to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stillcorp, and Zola Windows. Thanks also to our champion sponsors, Icon Windows and Doors, Prosico, and Siga. And a big thank you to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thanks too to our patron sponsors, Aero Aggregates, Aero Barrier, Brennan Brennan, Brooklyn Solar Works, Euroline Windows, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and U.S. Engineered Wood T-Stud. So big thank you to our sponsors. So on the podcast, we have a great episode with Pablo Sepulveda. Uh, it's an uh, interview with Matthew Cutler Welsh. Um, Pablo is a uh, practitioner in Victoria, Australia, and the two talk about his, he's an architect, um, but he's got a real affinity for engineering and the design power that it, that it confers. They also talk about this really cool pioneering project, and I'm, and I'm not gonna pronounce this correctly, it's, uh, uh, but it's uh, Na Kainga Anamata. It's a project in Auckland, New Zealand that's a pilot social housing. Um, it's five buildings of six units each, and they're exploring different approaches to reducing both operational and body, and embodied carbon. So it's really, really interesting uh, pilot project in Auckland. So please check out the podcast. And then uh, next week we have a project near and dear to my heart. It's in my hometown of Seattle, Washington. This is Hobson Place. It's the first supportive pa passive house uh, supportive housing passive house project in Seattle and probably many other places. Uh, supportive, supportive housing is combines affordable housing, in this case um, housing for uh, recently homeless people uh, with social services that serve service um, the, the community of people who live there. Um, it's a project that was led by an all-woman um, project uh, leadership team, um, a FIA certified, um, super, super cool demonstration project in Seattle, Washington. So join us for the project showcase next Wednesday. Then the week, the next week we have a, the first summit for the Passive House Accelerator of 2022. And this is being um, organized by Mary James. And this is the Prefab Summit from Design to Delivery. It's on Tuesday, March 22nd, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. You can see those very uh, distinguished guests who will be, um, be speaking. And I'll include a, sh a link to register in show notes, or not show notes, what am I saying? This is not the podcast. I'll in include it in chat. 
And then that same week on Thursday, we have the Building Performance Interactive, which is our UK Ireland based show. And uh, this is episode six of this series. It will be uh, entitled Achieving Thermal Performance in Modular CLT Developments. So I will also include a link to that in chat. And I want everyone to save the date for a very special event with our very own, I say that as our community, very uh, community member and, uh, and um, rabble rouser and troublemaker and great writer at Tree Hugger, Lloyd Alter. So Lloyd will be speaking about his book, Living the 1.5 1, 1. Degree Lifestyle. Um, and he will be joined by a couple of very familiar special guests after he presents about his, um, his book uh, for a panel discussion. We'll have lots of interesting Q&A and discussion. So we don't yet have the uh, registration link for you for that, but it's going to be March 29th. Thank you. Great stuff, Zach. Thanks. And, uh... Uh, Melvin has my copy of the book. Once he's finished with it in your Vancouver, let me know. I'm happy to pass it along or check out your local resources. Uh, and again, if you can find your local bookstore, support them. Great book, Lloyd. Great stuff. Looking forward to that. So many great events. It just keeps getting exciting. So um, great stuff. So it is now the top of the hour. We understand that we, we had you for the hour. And if you do must go, we appreciate you showing up. Of course, you've got homework. You know, we talk about this all the time. Next week, you got to bring a friend. And you know what? Might as well bring two, three, whatever you can do. Um, we will continue with the questions because there's def definitely more in the queue. But we thank you for joining us. Scott, I know we'll stay to the bitter end pretty much until my wife tells me it's dinner time and we have to abort. But until then, we are going to get nerdy. We're going to talk about some really cool stuff. And if you're talking about ventilation, this guy knows his stuff, which is great. So again, if you got to leave, good morning, good afternoon, good day to you. Uh, otherwise, let's kick off the overtime. Perfect. Well, we've got some more spike theories coming your way, Scott, from uh, Kelly and then Jeff Brown. Kelly, do you want to come on and give your theory to Scott? And if not, I can hand it out for you. Let's see, where is Kelly's theory? Ah, new furniture, bedding, or rugs? Yeah, all great guesses. Again, no, no new stuff. All the same old stuff, just. All right. Well, I, I had a, a theory that I'm going to throw in there. Now, your thermostat isn't programmed to kick on at these exact moments, is it? That's a good question. Um, so our, I have an Ecobee, which I really like because you get remote sensors and you get track temperatures and their platform is really great. We have it set to run the furnace fan, I think 10 minutes an hour. Um, it could be circulating stuff then, I, I don't know. Um, that's a good question though. All right. Well, let's move down to our next question from none other than Lloyd. Lloyd right. Alter, would you like to come on and ask a question? Just give him a second. He's just going to hit the mute button as he had to get another beverage. I think he's ready to go. Glasses are on. Lloyd, yeah, hit the mute take button. Take your time. There's no hurry. <laughs> Lloyd, it's your turn. Hit the mute button and ask your question. No, sorry, you I left for a hold. minute. I have nothing, nothing to say here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just left for a minute. I think, Lloyd, you asked if it was a combo fan over the gas stove. Wasn't oh. asking. Yes. What, what looked to me like there was a gas stove with a mic combination microwave unit and which as he said are completely useless <laughs> and was that a gas range because this is something i wrote a hundred posts about this on tree hugger and then the people who own us said oh you're not a doctor so you can't talk about health so we're taking down all your posts so everything i ever wrote about this was gone but like the fact of the matter is that they don't work and gas puts out your aware and your other detectors must be going off all of the time because uh, those those research, those microwave combo units, they don't come out far enough, as you mentioned, they don't do anything. And John Straub called them forehead greasers. Is Aaron still in the <laughs> audience? Aaron is this guy in Vancouver who developed a really fabulous, really expensive recirculating hood that will work in Passive House. I know it he was here earlier. But yeah, I'm like, still here, Lloyd. 
it's like three feet tall and has like 15 layers in it and it's going to cost thousands of dollars but it's the minimum that will do the job did i exaggerate aaron no that's about right i would like to hear the yeah your uh, um what, what are the general thoughts on uh, on tying the erv hrv into the aware systems and to the 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 hood fan if we are we, as, from a passive host perspective is it stepping into an unknown range what are people's thoughts on that i uh I'm not sure that 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 the aware would be a good control source. I do know that the Zender system does have sensors that can be put into. I know they have like a CO2 sensor that can be put in, and then uh, you know some of the controls could be done. On one project we did, we we were con we concerned about uh, the fireplace and the range hood working together. Um, uh, so we put in a temperature sensor at the at top of the uh, on on top of the stove that then. Would control the uh, the uh, the system that way. Temperature seems to be the best way to control. The CO two sensors tend to not last as long as we would hope. Um, uh, but uh -huh. know, there, there there are options, and a con better control of ventilation is is is, is always better. Yeah. Yeah. Fundamentally, I think the first thing that we have to do is before you even talk about the hood is just get rid of gas stoves. I mean, I'm still fighting with my wife over getting rid of ours. Uh, it's, people love them and, uh, you, you know, and but like this is what is the massive problem is just the methane that they put out. I just wrote an article, read research that even when they're off, they're leaking methane. Uh, and just in the time until the pizza starter lights the flame and there's a big poof of methane going into the air that's like, that's, that's incredibly toxic. And this is the first thing we should be doing. I agree, Lloyd. I, one of the coolest kitchens I ever saw was in Vancouver on, and in Whistler. The guy, he had a beautiful house on Lake Whistler and he had a clean kitchen inside, which was all induction electric passive house. And then right outside the door overlooking Lake Whistler was an outdoor kitchen, which was his dirty kitchen where he fried and he did grill. And it, it, was, it was just great to see. And everyone these days wants an outdoor kitchen because that's all the rage these days. And uh, why not have an, a, a clean kitchen and a dirty kitchen? You know? you know, that that approach has been what I've been trying to recommend to clients that come to us. If, if you want to cook with fire, take it outside. Um, still not great from a, you know, a climate emissions perspective, but at least you're not killing yourself immediately inside. Um, and I've been saying the same thing for fireplaces too. Um, a lot of people love fireplaces. I understand that's one of my things I love most. Um, but take it outside, try and integrate it into an outdoor space. Um, and then you just need to be careful that you're not, your ERV intake isn't on the, the same side as your outdoor fire area and you're pulling in PM 2.5. But if anyone, I mean, um, PM 2.5 goes bonkers in our house if anyone in the block is has a fire, like for heat, if their fireplace is going and they're burning wood, um, we see it. Uh -huh inside our house. I know what it's at too. And then I've got you know, a, a hack job, Aaron, what you had mentioned. So again, props to my wife. She introduced me to If This Then That, which is an application platform that can tie two smart devices together for you. And if certain triggers go off in our kitchen, we just, it runs the furnace fan. It's not the greatest approach, but it's the best we could do to like further try and dilute the house and move things around and uh, reduce the pollutants, at least in that area. And of course, the better solution is extract it all out and supply fresh air, but we're doing the best we can. I, I love smart technology integration. I'm sure that there's complexities and complications later down the road when you do too much of it, but I really like anything that talks to something else and it improves the controllability and functionality of your active systems. I like the separate the two dirty kitchen and clean kitchen ideas. I also love that that uh, tip you gave everyone for the single uh, induction cooktop from Ikea or wherever that's a plug in. So you don't have to upgrade your electric. You don't have to, uh, you know, swap out everything. It's basically a hot plate, a passive house hot plate. Love it. Um, I, so I like just yeah, quickly. I, I like that, too. Um, I, I, 
internally battle with adding more devices and equipment and embodied carbon and like all that just because I have a gas range. It would just, like Lloyd said, be better off just getting rid of that damn thing and getting an induction range in there. Um, but, you know, I we, we have a toaster oven that's convection and electric, so we don't use our actual gas oven anymore. And I've seen really big improvements from that, just that's not great. using the gas oven. And, um, I do uh, want that induction cooking. One, one piece of uh, share, shared stuff that worked in New York City was at Cornell Tech, the dormitory, they classified the kitchen as a kitchenette and they're able to, to not meet the code, not, not to go to the extreme of the code requirements, ask for a special like understanding of it. So if you reclassify your kitchen as a kitchenette, as just having a small induction and a small oven, not as a full kitchen, it kind of like helps play within that code Venn diagram of meeting the code requirements, the passive house requirements, and then the owner's requirements. So, but just something to keep in mind, the kitchens we're making tend to be a little smaller and then, you know, just call it an open floor plan and the island is a, is a dining room table. I don't know, just an idea. <laughs> is going to New York City for administrative relief or variance a nightmare like it is in Chicago? Uh, yeah, but... It, it's uh, it, for that it, scale it, project. Work. I, I, that scale and 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 to be honest with you, we were fighting. Uh, like I think Zoe mentioned, we they were fighting the the bath exhaust and the kitchens one not coming down. And as you point to passive houses being like, this is the best way to ventilate. This is what this is how it's done in Europe. Kitchens and bathrooms aren't different in, in Europe. You know, nobody's coming down with Legionnaires disease from from uh, having their their bathroom ventilated with their kitchen exhaust. They're just two dirty streams of air. And it, when you point out that you're using better equipment without any crossover in the ventilation unit, you know, I mean, that I think that's maybe why that might be there. But uh, it, we, we, we've, we've gone pretty far and then it's gone to a, a big fight and then it's a smaller fight and then it's kind of like a desk review now, I think. But um, uh, I don't fight those fights every day, though. <laughs> I might be fighting that fight on my next Chicago project. I think we're going to try and educate the city and hopefully get some change happening. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Scott. I hope that answered the questions so far. Our next one up is from, well, first I wanna ask the one from someone who had to leave, which was Sandra, because it leads right into the next question. So she was wondering, would a research fan with a filter do anything? And uh, before you answer, Jeffrey Roden had a couple of questions uh, linked, or I'm sorry, Scott Kennedy had a couple questions linked to that. So Scott, do you want to come on and ask your questions that are linked to that? I don't remember, I've had so much stuff in the chat because this is my favorite subject. It's the toughest subject in all the buildings we do. Uh, but we are doing a lot of recirculation hood fans uh, in our passive houses. And certainly my general sense of it is, is that the fact that you've got continuous ventilation clears this all of these particles out. But the question is, if we do use these charcoal filters, are we getting out the PM 2.5? Are we getting out some of these particles? And I've, I've had the opportunity to see this very fancy hood fan that's being developed here in Vancouver. And I, it's, it's marvelous. We do need a presentation on it. It's, it's got fantastic technology, a lot of really good thought. And I really do think that the principles I'll call them, they could be made attainable, they're not gonna be affordable, but they could be attainable, you know? Uh, at $5,000, it's not, but I think at, uh, you know, at $1,500, if we can get it there, uh, I think it would be, even if it's a little bit scaled down version, but a lot of the capture technology particularly, I think is wonderful, so anyways. I don't I'm have... just wondering, has anybody measured in a passive house with an aware, with some uh... cooking going on? I haven't seen it, so maybe someone else out there, but Scott, I've been calling for that study for a, a number of, maybe even a year now, where I wanna see the two in a controlled uh, research study. You've got your research hood, like you said, with your charcoal filter, and then uh, continuous exhaust, a general exhaust, you know, six, 10 feet off that surface in your, your kitchen, right? So you've got the air changes happening and you've got research at the source. I want to see indoor air quality of that versus a direct event, a direct vent exhaust at the source um, that 
goes back to something or just goes straight out. And then again, fresh air being supplied back in. I, I, I very, very enthusiastically want to see that data. Because I don't know. You know what? I'll, I'll bet you we could get the city of Vancouver to fund that. Uh, I bet you Chris Higgins would do it. Uh, he's got access to some cash if we could keep it reasonable and maybe find there's there's enough passive houses in Vancouver. Sean will know. <laughs> and we probably have some owners who would agree to it. I'll bet you we could do it. So I, let's let's make that a priority. Yeah, let's it's do that. It's time to call the budget bureau. I mean, yeah, yes, I'm God, sure we, we got, got somebody. We got 14 passive houses on the unofficial passive house street of dreams that we do on our bike tour. So I, I know a bunch of builders. We could talk to those homeowners and we also have a couple of buildings you were involved in that I'm sure some homeowners will connect with us. So. Yeah, I mean, the key, I think, is it's probably easier to do it on some single family stuff where people own suites. But uh, yeah, let's figure it out. Let's figure it out. Why, why don't we, uh, is Mike still on the, on, the, on the call? Is Mike still here or did he jump off? Because I don't see him. I don't see him. So let's volunteer him. So he lives oh. in a passive house. And well, we, I, I, I did buy him a Net Optimo, which was an air quality monitor. We'll see if he still has it. And then we'll do... Passive House Live cooking in Mike's kitchen and watch the effects. And I could do it in my non-passive house and show the uh, show how uh, <laughs> how my CO2 rises, my humidity goes up and down. Um, uh, we can do it almost like a, a summary of it. Might be a fun event. Yeah, Kevin, I can do it in my house too. I've got a gas stove and at my office is 20 feet away. And I get a text message saying that my family didn't turn on the hood fan. And I have to send them a text to be like, hey, Quit killing yourselves. Turn on the hood fan. Open a window, because the levels get above that you know line where the aware does not like it, and it sends me a text. So we can have some fun with this. So I'll go to Mike's house. We'll cook there. Like ingredients, you cook it in uh, in, in Vancouver in a non-passive house, and we'll, we'll we'll see how 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 it happens, and we'll prove that passive house ventilation, recirculate you know recirculating hood with just exhaust in the kitchen, how it it can it can work in 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 its design. And Zoe has dubbed it the cook-off. So I think that's with an O-P-H-P-H, -H, uh, but she just misspelled it in the chat. So I, I have a client who put uh, an air supply in the kick plate under his stove, and but that's not tempered at all, you know, and it's not filtered at all. So what, what's that doing to the balancing? Um, and then we all know that there's a couple of, mechanical units in the works that are gonna give us exactly what we want. And we just can't wait for those. So in the meantime, let's move to the next question from Jeff Brown. Jeff, are you still with us? I am. I am, hey everyone. Um, let me just, a couple of quick words about myself. So I have been tuning in to Passive House Accelerator now for two years since probably the start of COVID. I don't, I'm not an architect, I don't design buildings, and you guys are just awesome. You are the best evangelist, and I'm, I got interested because I'm interested in doing a passive house for myself. So I started tuning into your, to the accelerator on Tuesdays and then now Wednesdays. Um, it's a thing I look forward to every week. So um, I work though as an environmental consultant. I've been doing environmental consulting for 30 years. Um, I have done a lot of indoor air sampling um, my work to do indoor air sampling is usually um, in the realm of we're looking at um, indoor air quality as it's affected by releases of gasoline or solvents to soil and groundwater. And then we're looking at the passing of those VOCs through soil vapor into an overlying building. So we often get involved in indoor air quality when soil vapor concentrations show us that we could have an indoor air problem. So I've done a ton of VOC sampling in both single family and multifamily buildings. And I will tell you, um, and, and when um, Scott was mentioning that you're using a total VOC device, um, what I would say is that, have you ever looked at both what suite of VOCs or what range of VOCs that device handles? And then have you ever done a actual indoor air sample with say a six liter Suma canister and sent that off to a lab for 150 bucks, it'll tell you 80 VOCs in your air, individual VOCs. So when you're thinking about what VOCs are in your air and you're trying to ferret this out, I would be looking at what individual VOCs are in my indoor air first, and I would correlate that back to my totalizer. 
your total VOC analyzer, you might find what your VOCs are from is like natural human respiration, which when we all breathe, we generate things like acetone, isopropanol, which is isopropyl alcohol, ethanol, and methanol. And if you had a party on a Saturday night, you showed a graph there, which caught my eye. I, there was a peak, I think it was like on a Saturday night. And if you had a bunch of people in your house all breathing and laughing and carrying on at a party, you're going to see massive human VOC levels on that particular evening. And if your totalizer is picking it up, it'd be kind of nice to know that, that your VOCs are from human activity and human breathing rather than PCE or some more, much more dangerous VOC in your indoor air. So um, other th another thing, I just did some indoor air sampling here in Brantford, Connecticut, where I live at a, uh, at a unit that was affected by a, a fuel oil release, but we were doing indoor air to, to monitor the effectiveness of the remediation. And of course, the client, the homeowner um, gets all concerned. What are all these VOCs you're telling me about, Jeff? Um, what we found are that they had PCE, which is off gassing from their dry cleaning still, and we had levels of trihalomethanes, which are the four VOCs that are, that are the byproducts of chlorinating water. So if you're like doing laundry or taking showers, you're gonna see levels of trihalomethanes. They're gonna be low, but they include things like chloroform um, and then uh, two other that, that have long names that I, I'll forget right now. But um, I would correlate all that back. I would do for 150 bucks, I would do 80 VOCs in your space and find out what exactly the v the specific VOCs are. Yeah, we're we're right about there. But Jeff, what about farts? What are farts? Farts. farts. Don't I haven't measured farts. I would think I'd probably methane or something, right? Or or uh, <laughs> there's a the lot of carbon monoxide in a they fart. Say, they say cows are are one of the leading methane sources on the planet. I think we're um, just seeing the data and not being able to come to any reasonable conclusion and flushing the space only temporarily helps. I think we're at the next stage where doing that quality, uh, IQ test, sending yeah. it to the lab, figuring out exactly what VOC is yeah. in there and then work, you know, reverse engineer, work backwards, figuring yeah, out- Yeah, cor and correlate, I would take your total VOC and look at where do you see either, either daily or weekly or whatever, some of your higher peaks and then you can do an air sample for like a four hour period. You can even do down to like a two hour period. Um, we often get into looking at like a 24 hour day because uh, we're just interested in a composite, but you could correlate that. You could take your VOC analyzer and do it. Hey, we see peaks from six to 10 o'clock at night and just do a four hour sample at that time. Great Thank stuff. you so much, Jeff. Yeah, and honestly, I loved what you said when you first hopped on because I just assumed you were an expert. And uh, oh no, you guys you are, are just great we, though. You, you, you guys are like you do. guys are the best evangelists, and ex you generate such excitement through this. And there's you know maybe anywhere between fifty and one hundred and fifty participants each week. But I hope this crowd grows. I tell people that work at it. I work for a company um, headquartered in Massachusetts. And we have a building, a um, uh, 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 an MEP group, and they just did their first two. They did the MEP on two multifamily passive um, house, uh, passive uh, apartment buildings in uh, Mass. Congratulations! So our That's firms, awesome. our, our firms, our firm, our firm is just starting <laughs> to get involved. I don't know the yeah. I don't know the architects we work with. I'm not in that group. I'm I'm in the environmental group. But thank um, you. Exciting yeah. stuff. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. This is why we show up is to help grow and thanks for cracking us into a new market. So thanks, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. Keep, keep, keep it up. Keep up the energy. It's 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 infectious. We can't help ourselves. We're, we're, <laughs> addic we're addicted. That's how you know we're addicted. Our next question up is from Martin. Martin, um, are you yeah. still with us? I'm, Hi. Still, I'm still there. Uh, so um, I was recently in a passive house in, in uh, Littleton, Colorado which had a Zender um, um, ERV. It looked like a, an octopus, basically. Um, but I noticed that these ducts that they were feeding into the rooms were pretty small in diameter. So um, I'm, I was a little bit surprised to see the small diameter and 
Can you tell us more about the standards there? I'll, I'll well, jump on that one yeah, if you want, Scott. So the Zender, the Zender system runs on a home run ventilation system. So each tube is around three inches and then each tube delivers around 12 CFM. So I'm a 12, so two of them is 24, three of them is 36. I'm a, so that, that's basically how that system works. It's, it works off of a manifold and then going through the, the system. So. Uh, it uses many small ducts to achieve low flow ventilation. Um, uh, typically, a typically a, a a kitchen will a, a kitchen will get thirty six cfm out of the kitchen. A bathroom will exhaust twenty four, and normally bedrooms are around twenty four. And then you just balance them out throughout the throughout the built the, the house. And that's that's how the system works: balance ventilation. Now that there's some people have some worries with flex and things like that, but I. You know, the Zender approach seems to be pretty fantastic. Everyone seems to be very happy with it. I have you had, know. I have, I have also seen uh, people try to feed the ventilation through their existing duct system, and that falls short because that duct system is designed to run the air through the house, and it isn't always running with an air handler. So it, it, having a separate ventilation unit that runs twenty four hours a day with very small ducts. Is beneficial as opposed to having large ducts that handle your heating and cooling, um, uh, and then having it supplemented by the ventilation. Um, uh, so it, it's a bet. It's it's a it's it's not a an all in one purpose, but your ventilation unit is going to run twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, and then go into boost mode when it's required to when you're doing a, a humidity action or or, or or so. Hope that answered your uh, your question, Martin. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Keep it separate. Absolutely. Our next question up is from Sarah Bear, who came out into the chat with a whole lot of comments when you started talking about uh, centralized, decentralized, and semi-centralized. Sarah, you want to come on and ask your question? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so uh, just for a background, our firm is in New York City. We do a lot of multifamily and trying to shift our entire portfolio towards Passive House, but it's a work in progress. Um, and one of the hurdles we encounter is that, uh, you know, we have developers that want to bid build to code minimum. And, you know, the energy code in New York State is really getting more aggressive, which is great. But I haven't seen it make the transition to um, in requiring ERVs for multifamily buildings. And I'm wondering if there are thoughts out there, studies out there really demonstrating how code minimum, and you mentioned it, um, you know, the fact that expecting a third of our makeup there to come through leaky walls, just first of all, is not healthy. And second of all, is not feasible in current energy code air, air tightness requirements. So I'm wondering if there's studies, if, even if you just do the math of how much square footage of exterior enclosure your apartment is getting, you're not you're not going to be getting enough makeup air. So we put in trickle vents into our windows, which waste energy and don't work anyway. Um, so, you know, what kind of studies do we need to show that code minimums just not providing us with healthy air? And we're, we're learning so much more about how good quality air is so critical for our health. It's almost as important as, as sprinklers are to our safety. And, you know, that was a major code shift, you know, whatever, 60, whatever, 60 years ago. Uh, but, but how do we get to that level of code change uh, with regards to, to air? I don't know if I have a good answer for you because that's a really good question and something that we've been working hard in Chicago to, to overcome too with all the weird little requirements. I do know that I think, at least in ASHRAE, after a certain size of a unit, you are required I think to do an energy recovery. You are required to do energy recovery. I don't remember the specifics offhand, but if you do have a centralized makeup air system, then I think you might find yourself in a ERV regardless. And maybe someone who's more apt in New York could talk and then I can follow up with my, my policy thoughts after that. Sarah, I would look back to how SRA 62.2 went through the process of developing. In the early days of 62.2, they used to give an infiltration credit where you would needed less ventilation if you had a leakier building or a leakier apartment, um, uh, which was 
kind of bizarre. Um, uh, <laughs> but that was one of the things that they were suggesting in 62.2, I believe, in the early days. I don't think it's required now because it's gone through a few different iterations. And then I would also look at in, in New York City and around the country, some of the weatherization uh, have companies have done really great studies on ventilation about how natural ventilation trickle trickle vents and you know extract only ventilation from kitchens and bathrooms really don't perform they you know the middle the middle apartments don't don't really get ventilated all that well um uh, and i would lean a little towards that i've done pretty good information there besides that i think passive house ventilation the approach tends to be where we should go and then code minimum clients you know you just have to try and bring them along the way to explain to them what the what the the situ the, the hazards might be sure I'm, I'm thinking at least on your question is on your question about what it takes to to get energy recovery in the project on your more business as usual projects it, simply an energy model will tell you pretty quickly that you're going to perform better with energy recovery passive house or not at the energy model level for your ventilation you're going to see energy savings there if your clients are going to own and operate that building, it's an easier conversation because you're saving them money annually, monthly on utility. Uh, if they're going to turn around and sell the building, then we're, you know, we're in the conundrum that a lot of us face all the time with split incentives where developers don't want to pay upfront costs because they're trying to, you know, sell the building quickly and don't care about operational savings. So depends on your clients. Uh, I, I, let me look around, I can, I'm sure I can find some stuff for you, but if you have an energy model, you could very easily show the benefits of energy recovery on any ventilation system. Single family, multifamily, commercial, doesn't matter. It's worth it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there's a great study by Energy Efficiency Vermont I, that actually Zender pointed me to about this level of CO2 that builds up at night with in code code minimum buildings and to advocate for um, for ERVs and I, I yeah just putting it out there I there was another study that seemed to be birthed in this meeting and I'm hoping to have that moment um, at some point soon for another study like that. Let me. I'll blow your mind quickly with how weird Chicago is. We can still provide ventilation through a pressurized corridor. So we don't even need to bring fresh air into the dwelling unit. You could put it into a common corridor and then it just like seeps its way in. That's allowed. And that's what a lot of people want to do because it's cheap. It's hoping COVID could show people shared air may not always be. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> we did this whole series to our developer clients about during like the heat of the pandemic about why this just is a deal break. It, it, if it wasn't a non-starter before to do corridor, pr pressurized corridor makeup, it, it certainly is now with the transmission of viruses in, in COVID and the pandemic and it's still happening, sadly. Sarah, one, one thing about CO2 production and uh, is a good thing to bring up the, the importance of it was that uh, Catholic school teachers and nuns had a very deep understanding of how CO2 would build up and young uh, poor students like myself would start to fall asleep and then they would open the windows and then uh, freeze people out. Don't ask me how I know this, but uh, I also met the ruler a few times, but that had nothing to do with me, uh, me uh, sleeping. But there's a lot of good studies out there about ventilation and CO2 production, especially which in the student learning environment and with COVID and, and, and all the pushes to, uh, to actually ventilate those, those rooms, we should really be measuring some data and pushing them towards actual balanced ventilation as opposed to just exhaust ventilation and then help those schools get to that, that, that next level and prove that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's possible. It's my soapbox and my story. It's the overtime. I think I'm going to wave that, right, guys? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for the questions and also the reading recommendations. Really appreciate that.
Our next question is from Jeffrey. Well, first of all, I have to direct uh, um, a huge applause to uh, Jeff Brown for his uh, quick education on uh, human uh, VOCs. I never knew that. And it's one of the reasons I love this, uh, uh, this show every week. It's just, you always learn something new from somebody. It's great. So thanks, Jeff. That's a, it's a great thing. Um, my question kind of gets back to the um, bedroom uh, high VOC problem. And I was wondering if, uh, you know, zonal testing, which is a technique that a lot of HERS raters are trained on, um, has been done. And could that offer any insights into sort of narrowing down the source of the VOCs? If it's not human, it could be, you know, the uh, occupants of the bedroom. That's a good question. Uh, um be frank, we haven't done anything worthwhile that would make all the sense in the world. We're just gathering data and trying to figure out what the next steps are. So I think this inadvertently has become uh, an amazing evening where I'm getting a ton of great recommendations on what to do to track this thing down and figure out what's going on. So some level of testing to me is clearly the next step. I don't know if it's the zonal testing or um, the, the testing that Jeff recommended, but something needs to be done to figure out what the heck is happening at this point. I would, I would, I would maybe uh, suggest ambient pressure diagnostic, go room to room and see what the pressure is under each room. Is, is that room pressurized or depressurized might be helpful to know. Yeah. But that's pretty I, much what Jeff is saying. Yeah. I would in, and I'd also love to see the way, like whether it's a, a CFD, analysis or like, I wanna see how the air is moving through our home. Where is stuff coming from? Is it through stack effect pulling up just outside our bedroom in that stairwell and, and that's the cause. I, I, there's just so much more I wanna know and figure out and it's a passion project and we all know that passion projects take the back seat to real life. So um, we're working on it. We're still alive. I guess that's a good thing. We're not dead yet from this issue <laughs> there's vocs everywhere yeah the more you know uh, the more you're scared i guess all right scott we've got one more question for you unless more pop into the chat while we're talking from ilana hold on yeah are you there Can yeah you hear hello we hear you hey yeah i'm 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 in the car now <laughs> Yeah, so I had a question about, you know, when you've got a client who really wants their fireplace, is there, are there any inserts, any, um, what is it called? See, it's too late. I can't even think. <laughs> no. Wood-burning um, fireplace inserts. Wood-burning fireplace yeah. inserts. Yeah, the, the heating kind because they got their fireplace and, you know, and they want to upgrade. Are there any that are a little bit better or should you just say you know what put some candles there and you know the little led candles and call it a day yeah i'm glad you said you changed it to led candles because actual candles yeah, yeah LED candles candles. Make, <laughs> the actual candles will make your indoor air quality go quite bonkers as well so um i you know i don't the fireplace is a perplexing issue because i know how dear near and dear it is to many people um, I've seen people be okay with that, you know, the fake electric where it gives off some heat, but then, you know, you got electric resistance heat there, so you're losing, it's not great on your energy budget, um, and it's just visual. Uh, I would love, if, if someone has a good experience with a wood-burning stove, I know that those are more sealable, and you can provide makeup air directly to the stove, so it's like really very much a closed-loop system. Um, I, I want to learn more about that because I'm interested in, in possibly that strategy. Uh, but I, again, I don't, I'd love to see the data there with, with that wood burning stove, which is supposedly closed door sealed, fresh air going directly to it. So there's no, hopefully no emissions. Yeah, because I was looking at some wood burning stoves um, that supposedly were good, but uh, you know, one thing is what somebody is producing is uh, publishing on their website. Another thing is real life experience. Yeah. Does anyone have yeah, any? Yeah, wood burning stoves. And any, which one do you recommend? The Wittis? 
Yeah, we have two in a multifamily, two unit, two dwelling passive house project, and they both have direct air intakes. Um, so the doors are always closed and airtight um, and they don't create a load on the ventilation system, but they do put a, you know, a, a load on the, either take a load from the heating system or overheat, you know, and then require some windows to be open. But I love the Phoenix by uh, Optifier or OptiWin, I think it's called. I'm looking for the link right now and I'll drop it in the chat in a minute. They have one that's really, really beautiful where the glass door goes up and down instead of being a door that opens on a hinge. So it doesn't um, create a problem with the floor space there. But then you have the option of leaving that glass up in which case, yeah, there's still a direct air intake, but you're also playing with the air in the room more if that airtight door isn't closed. But I have never seen an insert for an existing prior place, uh, Elena, that has the ability to do a direct air intake. If you've got a frame house and you've got a wood burning fireplace in a frame house, I'd say, yeah, then you can do you know, a retrofit with a direct air intake and put in a, a number of units. but that's not usually the case when I'm seeing those people who love their wood burning fireplaces. It's usually a big stone fire. I would I would really try and convince him to put it outside. He, Mike Mike's firm has done a great job at putting them on either roof decks or outdoor side decks, and they're they're beautiful. I mean, you, you get your roof back when uh, you do a passive house. You don't need all the ventilation equipment and then you know, everything on the roof. You get a roof deck, and they the first one was at 88th Street and. It, it was an amazing, you know, fireplace on the roof on top of, you know, closely looking over Central Park. It was great to see. And then a horror story from a passive house that wasn't certified. And we did a really good job. 0.7 air, air, air changes per hour. Needed the fireplace. First night running in the house, cooking with the with their backup makeup air range hood on. And they lit the fire and the whole house smoked out because the the range hood was pulling air down the chimney greater than it was allowed to go up. So um, uh, they put the fire out and, and, and it, they were like, this fireplace isn't really working. And then they went back and it was like, well, you were cooking. So the range hood was on and it was, you know, those range hoods are 400 CFM and the house at 50 Pascal is 600 CFM. So um, uh, it's just the effect of, of the, how, those, how those things work. But um, uh, it's tough to get fireplace, traditional wood burning fireplaces to function and operate properly in a passive house as well. Because you turn that fireplace on and it's, you know, the amount of heat that comes out of it, you have to open up windows because um, uh, there's a lot of heat coming out of the, uh, out of the, out of the fireplace when you're yeah, loaded. I will, I will say that it really helps to have a damper that controls that uh, direct air intake because that'll control the size of the flame and it'll keep you from being at the whim of how much wood you put in by mistake or. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm looking forward to Miss, oh, she put up the link for the Phoenix. Good, I'm gonna take a look. Uh, I'm simultaneously looking for stuff like, and you know, I'm using buzzwords like EPA certified fireplace, things like that. Uh, because we have had, uh, I realize particular emissions, et cetera, uh, but we're a geothermal house and some other things, and we really only use it when the outdoor air temperature gets to the point where we're starting to risk using heat strips instead of the heat pump. Uh, and uh, as she points out, you can have them so that they are completely sealed from the rest of the house, right? So you can have makeup air into them. Uh, and in our case, it was a fire, it's a wood burning fireplace inside a box uh, that. Um, can have fans and things like that, but the box uh, um, takes heat off of the fireplace and puts it into the uh, into the building. Uh, but what we did is rather than have it come out into the living room, uh, it goes up and back into a stairwell behind it. So it so the heat so you're only getting the radiant heat out the front. You aren't getting the 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 uh, air coming off of the the, the unit. And the, the heated air is going into the fireplace and starting convection current through the whole house. And so it's not, it doesn't make you leave the living room and it does uh, heat the whole house. Uh, literally uh, below uh, 32 outside, uh, we will have a, a fire in there and, the, and, and pretty
pretty much the whole house will run at about 70 degrees. So not even the heat pump kicks on at that point. Uh, so we'll go, we'll go days uh, when the outside te temperature drops with nothing but that and the living room is not excessive. So if you look into it, there are a variety of ways to keep the particular emissions out of the house, even though I admit that from the neighborhood perspective, um, et cetera. So it's possible uh, with some research and thought. Thanks, Eric. We appreciate the input. What do we got next, Shannon? Sorry about that. I just had to throw something else in the chat, which is a similar, really, really old, old technology called a kachalafen which is a lot like the Wittis because it has all these chambers in it. So it gets that like 93 to even more percent efficiency when you burn the wood. You basically put in one stack of wood and it burns all day long and it heats the whole house. But it's a thermal mass and it has to be in the center of the house and it has to have a direct air intake. But it's all German um, units that are built into this masonry mass. And you can cook on it. There's a cooktop on it, but as you'll notice, there's no hood vent over that cooktop when you go to the homepage. But um, it's it's another really interesting way of thinking about heating a house that maybe you aren't going to go passive, but you want to use a renewable resource, and you know your envelope is maybe not what you want it to be. <laughs> so I, I think we're out of questions, Kevin. But Peter I, has his has his hand raised very kindly. Does he? Oh, yeah. Peter, jump in. The pronunciation of the word is kachel oven. Kachel, kachel oven. Kachel oven. <laughs> no, ka kachel, kachel. It's very guttural. Kachel. Thank you, Peter. Oven. Thank you very any, much. Yeah. Any complex, com complex adjectives you want to throw at us in German as well? <laughs> no, no umlauts today. No, sorry. I had the pleasure of actually working with the, the woman who she designs the tiles and does make the tiles and the glazes by hand. And her engineer didn't speak any English. So we had to just coordinate with drawings, which was beautiful and wonderful. But um, I did not go back to that project and measure the air in the indoor air quality. So maybe I need to take a little aware unit over there and see how they're doing. Well, thank you, Scott, so much for tonight. Uh, if I missed your question and you're still here, please unmute yourself and jump in and introduce yourself. But I think we got to everyone's questions. Scott, I got to know, uh, when you were an architect and you moved over into this side of things, like, what was it that made you make that shift? Um, I was working for a firm, which is a great firm, and they do great work, but they weren't, you know, sustainability was only part of uh, requests from certain clients, institutional clients, you know, clients that had the money to do that stuff. And there wasn't enough push from the, the bottom line or to improve the bottom line. Um, and I just felt really limited in my ability to make an impact. I really wanted to work on projects that were energy efficient and high performance because that's just what needs to happen. And it just wasn't occurring at that place. So I found, and maybe it's counterintuitive, but I found by shifting to consulting or engineering, I was being hired to work on projects that wanted that thing specifically. Um, so maybe I wasn't increasing the bottom line necessarily, but I was being brought on to projects be for for that reason, um, in that to me was a really what I wanted to do. You know, uh, I didn't want to be working on business as usual, code compliant projects anymore. Congratulations, that's awesome! Now very you're pushing awesome. the envelope. Yeah, and I realize that's a very like privileged position to be in too. I know that not everyone can do that, and there's lots of people that do great work with what they're given and. and appreciate them for that too. I just, I, I had the opportunity to make a change. And, and I... Well, you've been on our show twice and I think you're making an impact with us and we appreciate your input and sharing and your, your passion. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's great to see. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. yeah and we've got a couple yeah. of hands, hands up. we got a couple hands up too. So uh, Brian and then Peter. Okay. Well, my question, I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota in a student's cooperative. So 
insured houses, you can't anticipate whatever else is going to do. And so one of the things I've been looking for is, you know, I found good things for, you know, you exhaust your dryer vent and it opens up and it doesn't let the birds in. But to when something does depressurize your house with the range hood, and we have people who cook with walks, so they, the most efficient fan, um, it can move 420 cubic feet really easy. And so then the question is, okay, is there something that will just open it up? Because I like try to Cape Cod, um, it's like a backdraft stopper to just let the water, sorry, let the air come in, but not let it go out. Um, you know, I don't really want to go with something mechanical if it could just kind of passively open whenever somebody turns on this thing that just starts sending everything out the house. I'm not familiar with a product that will do that, Brian. Maybe someone else is. I, I hate to like, the human behavior thing there is tricky because the easiest solution would be to open as many windows as you can, right? But then you're relying on people to do that and that never happens the way you hope or plan. Um, yeah, I don't have great feedback, unfortunately. I think you're in a bit of a peculiar situation and I'm sorry for that. So yeah, because I'm kind of thinking like when, when you have the kitchen thing, you if we could get it to go towards Fios or something, enter fit towards passive direction, we'd still need some sorts of escape valves <laughs> to when they just violate the rules, you know? Seems like this is pretty much, this is emerging technology territory. It sounded like there was someone at Aaron who's developing something. And I, I wish there was a better solution than the, the motorized damper that's interlocked to something and you're relying on it to function the way you need it to. I, yeah. I'm sorry, Brian, I don't have a good, good answer. Thanks. Maybe, hopefully, maybe someone else does as well. Well, thanks, Brian. And we all know that there's room for improvement in kitchen ventilation, hoods, capture efficiency, um, uh, all these places. And we all know we need more ERVs and different solutions on the market. So let's, uh, let's start figuring out where we're going to get these magic boxes and combination units designed and developed for the U.S. market. Because the cheaper and more affordable they are, the easier they'll go into our projects and we can solve these issues. I see Peter has his hand raised for maybe our final comment. Okay. Yeah, Scott, great presentation. Thank you for the information. Um, in your transition as an architect, how much fluid techno or fluid uh, dynamics and thermal dynamics did you get as an engineer? That's a great question. Um, my, my engineering knowledge is increase exponentially, way more than I could have ever hoped or dreamed for if I were to stay in the architecture realm. I would say thermal dynamics, I probably, I think I learned the most going through the, the Passive House program and training. That really has expanded my knowledge base the most out of anything I've done to date. And then just being in an engineering position now, it further compounds on, on that. And it just, I, I'm very lucky. I have the ability to, to like embrace both sides and it, it's been an incredible experience. And I also love being the one to be, to bridge the engineering speak with the architecture speak on some of these big commercial projects where we on the engineering side really just talk about numbers and, and data. And obviously architects are visual um, love the visual and the graphics and, and I can really help kind of translate things to, to be more di digestible and, you know, just communicating stuff has been a, a passion of mine. So I, I really love kind of the flexibility I have in my position right now to, to do a lot of that stuff. And yeah, I just to, to go back, I rambled a lot there. I think the passive house training really, really was the biggest driver in, in both fluid and computational learning and, and expertise and stuff like that. And yeah, in writing my CPHT that uh, I found my background from mechanical engineering technology to be very helpful in understanding uh, what the calculations are and what, oh yeah, of course, of, of course you want it that way. So yeah. <laughs> the, the discussions here tonight about the um, 
proper kitchen fan, research fan, no. Uh, it needs to be drawn air and exhaust air and to balance the uh, HRV, ERV. So all, all these things, and that's my interest is in the um, MEP, the mechanical side of things. And uh, I just appreciate the, the level of knowledge of all the calculations, the energy calculations they have to do for uh, thermal and for fluid. Go ahead. Yeah, you're no stranger to, you know, heat loss and heat load calculations, I'm sure. So you're right at home with all that. I think, you know, I think the passive house world produces some of the best practitioners out there. Just, I'm just going to say the, that. Uh, because it Passive House Institute has a great uh, article about capture efficiency of, uh, of different range hoods. And uh, it's, it's really, they have good visuals of, you know, steam coming up and what gets lost and missed. And it's, uh, it's, it's very enlightening. And, and our cooking styles is, uh, you know, front burner-esque, you know, because it's easier <laughs> to cook there. But, you know, yeah. it's, it's, there's a lot to, uh, lot, lot to learn. So, but the, the, there is definitely room for improvement. Yeah, I mean, just mentioning that, Kevin, if I, I've seen some studies where it shows how strong, you know, the buoyancy effect in that when you're boiling water or other things, the pull of that fan isn't getting it. Um, I'm sure that study touches on that. It's just, you know, it's mind blowing. You think there's a big fan pulling air towards this thing, it's going to grab everything, but the thermal, de you know, the, the physics says otherwise and it, yeah it's crazy I, yeah fingers crossed that it's working right <laughs> right all right everyone this has been you, amazing Scott. yeah thank you so much awesome questions thank you for having me this has been really great um maybe i'll go for a trifecta in the next couple months uh, that would be yeah. fantastic you you're uh always invited the door is always open and we'd love to have you back Especially if you get some more data and figure out where those spikes were coming from. Now we all need to know what's happening in Scott's house. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks again. And have a great uh, night. Everybody remember to grab those three buttons at the bottom of the chat and save the chat. Oh yeah, a hot trick. Exactly. We gotta get our our hockey lingo in here since Sean is gone. Sean uh, had to run to a hockey game. He sends his best and uh, hopefully he 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 witnesses a hat trick tonight. And Mark <laughs> was uh, put in the penalty box in a meeting, <laughs> but he sends his best as well. Thank you all. Have a great night, everyone. See you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>